From the St. Francis Yacht Club in San Francisco, this is the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, hosted by Ron Young. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon, live from the virtual grill room of the St. Francis Yacht Club. We hope that you and yours are sheltering in place in a safe environment, and we look forward to greeting you back in our Yacht Club just as soon as conditions permit. Everybody is familiar with the great battles, the sea battles in big wars, especially World War II, where there were major battles in the Pacific and incredible battles in the Atlantic. Most people don't pay as much attention to how our servicemen were fed, how they got supplies, how they got materials, how they got ammunition. Our speaker today, after graduating from Amherst College, joined up with the Navy and then went off to Harvard Law School and with a degree at Harvard Law School, began practicing admiralty law. And I don't know where he found the time, but he became president of the National Liberty Ship Memorial and as such has custodial authority over the wonderfully restored liberty ship, Jeremiah O'Brien, birthed in San Francisco's Fisherman's Wharf and available for visitors seven days a week. She's right next to the World War II submarine Pampanito. Forrest, it's wonderful for you to take time from your law practice to tell us all about the Jeremiah O'Brien. Welcome to the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. And thanks so much for your service. Thank you, Ron. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, I'm looking forward to talking about the Jeremiah O'Brien since it's one of my favorite topics. As Ron said, I am a practicing maritime lawyer, so I'm in the maritime industry. I've uh, learned a lot about shipping over the years. Uh, but more importantly, I learned about Liberty Ships being the chairman of the corporation uh, that owns and operates the Jeremiah O'Brien, the National Liberty Ship Memorial. The National Liberty Ship Memorial was put together uh, as a tribute to the men that sailed the Liberty Ships in World War II and shortly thereafter, and the men and a few women who built them in the shipyards, which I'll talk about a little bit more. But I also know a certain amount about Liberty Ships because I sailed on one for 19 months in the U.S. Navy as an officer. That is the ship I was on. Uh, it was called the USS Tutuila. It was a somewhat altered Liberty ship from World War II. Uh, and we spent most of our time in and around Cambodia and Vietnam during the Vietnam War, supporting uh, the river boats, swift boats, and mic boats uh, of the Brownwater Navy, as we called it. Uh, it was uh, quite an interesting ship because it had a sheet metal shop, uh, a woodworking shop, a foundry, an electronic shop, an optical shop, uh, and uh, just about anything else you can imagine, and uh, could uh, was very capable of repairing just about anything. In my mind, the Jeremiah O'Brien is a much better looking Liberty ship because it is unaltered. Uh, it is exactly the way it was built uh, in South Portland, Maine. Uh, and it is one of only two Liberty ships that actually can get underway under their own power. And the other one, which is in Baltimore, has been substantially altered and doesn't look exactly like it did when it was built. So we're fond of the fact that the Jeremiah O'Brien is the last unaltered Liberty ship. There were 2,710 Liberties built during World War II between 1941 and 1945. This is the largest class of ship ever built. There's no other class that comes anywhere near the numbers uh, of the Liberties. And if you took all the Liberty ships ever built and laid them bow to stern, end to end, they would stretch 226 miles all the way from San Francisco to Reno, Nevada. If you stop and think about that, that's a pretty incredible undertaking. Building one ship is a significant event, a significant achievement. 2,710 of them is hard to fathom. All the Liberty ships were built on the same design. So they're all functionally the same in terms of statistics, 441 feet long, 57 feet across, and fully laden uh, draft of 28 feet. The full displacement is over 14,000 tons, about 7,500 of which is cargo. The traditional layout was five holds and five hatches, one engine, 2,500 horsepower, and was capable of a maximum speed of 11 knots in theory. That's brand new with a clean bottom and uh, <laughs> proper conditions, shall we say. 
um, on the uh, Liberty ship that I served on, we were headed up to Hong Kong one time. We came through the tail end of a typhoon and we hit about 50 knot winds. And we steamed at full speed for 24 hours and went backwards 22 miles. So the, uh, <laughs> they are not the fastest ship on the planet by any means. They have a little bit of windage? Uh, just a little bit of windage, <laughs> a whole lot. <laughs> but the purpose of a Liberty ship is what we said of the Navy was beans, bullets, and black oil. Uh, we provided the soldiers and sailors with what they needed, food, ammunition, every kind of supply uh, you can imagine. Most of the Liberties were configured with five holds and five hatches, like the Jeremiah O'Brien. But there were a few that were uh, dedicated to other purposes and were built that way. Uh, some were oil tankers, uh, hospital ships, troop transports, coal carriers, um, uh, tank carriers, and one of them was even uh, fitted out to, with a small nuclear generator as an electric generating station. Uh, two of the interesting ones uh, were modified to carry mules for the 10th Mountain Division of the U.S. Army uh, during its invasion of Italy during World War II. They were loaded up with mules, put into a convoy and sent across towards Europe. Unfortunately, one of them was torpedoed and it did not make it. But the other one arrived, uh, went into the Mediterranean, delivered the mules to the 10th Mountain Division and they were very helpful in carrying the heavy guns and ammunition and all the equipment the soldiers needed. The Jeremiah O'Brien was named after a gentleman who was a minor figure in the US American Revolution. Uh, he came from Maine originally, and the ship was built in Maine, so they thought that was an appropriate title for the ship. The ship was built in South Portland, Maine at what was then New England Shipbuilding. Uh, it took 56 days to build, uh, April, May, June of 1943. Uh, it took 56 days, and it cost a little under $2 million. That <laughs> is just amazing. Yeah, it would be... Uh, uh, considerably more than that, shall we say, today. But that was what they were able to do in those days. The shipyard no longer exists in South Portland, Maine, but there is a memorial to the, the Liberty ships that were built there. Uh, this is the memorial. It's kind of a stylized bow of a Liberty ship with a gun tub up above. Um, and uh, unfortunately, that's about all that remains. The Jeremiah O'Brien made five convoy trips across the Atlantic after it was built. Uh, to England in each case. And then just before the Normandy invasion, it was in Southern England waiting for the invasion to take place. And once the troops arrived on the shores of France, it made seven, 11 shuttle trips across the English Channel, carrying uh, mostly troops, sometimes cargo, sometimes ammunition uh, in support of Operation Overlord. Then after Germany surrendered, the Jeremiah O'Brien went through the Panama Canal to the Pacific and did some island hopping across the Pacific, uh, again, carrying cargo uh, and sometimes troops uh, to support the uh, effort against Japan. The story of building Liberty ships is really the story of two men. Uh, the gentleman on the right is a minor politician that some of you have probably seen before. His name is Roosevelt. Um, the gentleman on the left might not be so familiar. Uh, until you hear the name Kaiser Permanente Healthcare System. That is Henry J. Kaiser. And uh, Kaiser was a very successful uh, industrialist in the United States. He had been involved in WPA projects during the depression. He had been involved in building the Hoover Dam, the Grand Coulee Dam, and a variety of other major construction projects uh, in the 30s. And he uh, already knew President Roosevelt from that uh, effort. He is actually an amazing human being. He really was. There was, uh, there was Kaiser Cement, Kaiser Steel, Kaiser Aluminum, Kaiser Construction Company. And then Kaiser per what became Kaiser Permanente was actually a healthcare program put together to treat uh, injuries of shipyard workers that were building the Liberty ships, which I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. There was um, also a car. It was a Kaiser car. It was a Kaiser car as well. Yeah, he was yeah. Uh, an amazingly... Uh, ambitious, energetic guy. In 1939, Henry J. Kaiser was in Washington and he arranged a meeting with President Roosevelt. And he sat down with Roosevelt and he said, Mr. President, there's gonna be a war in Europe. 
Uh, Roosevelt, according to other people at the meeting, was non-committal uh, because he knew there was a lot of pacifist sentiment in America. A lot of people did not want the U.S. to get into another world war. We'd been through World War I. But uh, Kaiser persisted and he said, Mr. President, there's going to be a war and you're going to need a lot of ships. And again, the president was somewhat non-committal. And Kaiser said, Mr. President, I want to build those ships for you. So Roosevelt said to him, well, Henry, how many ships have you built? And Kaiser said, none. And Roosevelt said, well, Henry, how many shipyards do you have? Kaiser said, none. Roosevelt said, well, Henry, how do you propose to build these ships? Kaiser looked at him and said, Mr. President, I will build the shipyards and then I will build the ships. And that is exactly what he did. He started in Richmond, California, just north of San Francisco, with what is known as Richmond Yard Number 1, right in the center of the picture there. It was about a half a million square feet of uh, manufacturing facility. And that was completed in December of 1940, before Pearl Harbor. Uh, but he quickly went on to build Yard Number 2, which was even bigger, a little more than half a million square feet. And Richmond Yard Number 2 was completed in April of 1941, again, before Pearl Harbor. Then after the attack on Pearl Harbor, he built Richmond Yards 3 and 4, which were completed uh, in early 1943. The land that you're looking at has all been repurposed, uh, redeveloped, and, and used for other things now, um, with the exception of one of the yards. Kaiser Yard Number 3 in Richmond is largely intact. It's still there. Um, you can see the five graving docks that where they built the ships. And the way a graving dock works is there's a caisson that is floated in that goes across the open end of the graving dock. That seals it off, then the water's pumped out, and you can build or repair a ship or whatever. Then the water's pumped back in, the caisson is floated out, and the ship comes out. Uh, Richmond Yard number three is used largely for long term storage of ships that don't have much purpose anymore uh, nowadays, uh, but it is still pretty much intact. Um, Pesha has taken over as an automobile terminal all the area to the left uh, in the photograph. Um, and there is another World War II veteran in the picture. In the lower right-hand corner, the Red Oak Victory is a victory ship that was also built during World War II. The victory ships were a class that came after the Liberty ships and uh, were a little, little larger and a little faster. In addition to Richmond, there was a yard across in Marin County in Sausalito. On the Sausalito waterfront, Mr. Bechtel, not to be outdone by Kaiser, uh, also built a shipyard. He reclaimed 210 acres of marshy land and built building ways and uh, created a shipyard where there was nothing but open land before. And during the war, they built 93 ships at that facility, uh, of which 15 were Liberty ships. The rest were largely tankers. Marin ship, as this was called, was an interesting operation because it was literally a company town. Uh, it had accommodations for 6,000 people. It had churches, shops, uh, movie theaters, recreational facilities, bowling alleys, uh, and as I said, housing for 6,000 people. Uh, and some of the housing of Marin ship still exists uh, in, Rich, in uh, Marin County today. So here's one of the finished products, uh, leaving uh, yard number two in Richmond, sailing out uh, with a tug escort. There were 747 Liberty ships built in the Bay Area. As a publicity stunt, Richmond yard number two actually built a Liberty ship in four days, 15 and a half hours. You think about building a 410 foot long ship in a little over four days, it's really quite amazing. They did it as a publicity stunt basically to show the Germans and the Japanese what we could do. Um, it was not something that they did regularly. In fact, it took a massive effort of pre-staging all the equipment, uh, building some of the ship in modules ready to put together and assemble and so forth. But it was in fact done that quickly. Usually a <clears throat> Liberty ship took about 50 days to build in the early stages of the war. And later on when they got a little better at it, it took 41 days. Building of ships and the munitions industry in general in America 
created the most significant demographic change that the United States has ever seen. Uh, this is one of the Richmond yards at a change of shift and the people in the picture are coming off shift and another group was going to work. But if you look at the picture carefully, particularly in the lower part, you'll see there are a lot of women in the workforce. The munitions industry needed workers and the men were off in the Navy, the Army, the Marines, the Coast Guard, they were off fighting the war. So uh, this created a tremendous opportunity for women to be employed outside of the home in manufacturing, which they had never been before. Also, <clears throat> it created huge demographic changes in the area where the shipyards were. Wilmington, California, down by Los Angeles, for example, and Portland, Oregon, and elsewhere. The population of Richmond, California increased from 20,000 to over 100,000 people in less than three years by people coming in. And a great many of them were agricultural workers who moved up from the southern part of the United States to work uh, in industry for the first time. So one of the striking features of this photograph is how thin everybody is. I don't really see anybody who's even mildly overweight in this picture. Did you squeeze this with Photoshop or were people healthier? <laughs> no, I think people worked really hard. I think they were thin as a result. <laughs> You're right. There's, there's, nobody, uh, there's nobody who needs an Atkins diet uh, in that picture, that's for sure. <laughs> In uh, Richmond Day, there is a memorial to infamous Rosie the Riveter, the uh, women who came to work uh, in the yards and uh, were at least apocryphally known as riveters. Uh, interesting in this picture, uh, both of the women are African-American. Uh, there were opportunities, uh, more or less equal opportunities uh, for uh, African-Americans as for anyone else, because the yards needed workers, as did all the munitions uh, factories. But the fact of the matter is Rosie the Riveter is uh, a fiction. It was actually Wendy the Welder. The riveting process had largely gone out because riveting is hard work and it is slow. You take a rivet, you heat it up in a fire, get it red hot, you get two pieces of steel, you line up the holes together, you put the rivet through it. One person holds a sledgehammer against the head of the rivet. The other person on the other side takes a sledgehammer and peens over the back of the rivet so it can't pop out through the hole anymore. And that whole process is slow. And then you repeat it for the next rivet and the next rivet and the next rivet and so forth. With welding, a crane picks up a big piece of steel, lays it against the side of the ship. The welder tack welds top, bottom, left, right, and then goes all the way around the four sides, welds it up, and you're done. It is many times faster than riveting. So most of the women who were trained as workers in the shipyards were trained as welders. And you see these seven ladies here uh, are all welders. They've got their welding helmets flipped up. Uh, three of them have welding leads in their hands uh, and they're wearing protective equipment. So the Liberty ships are actually a very old design. It was a British design um, and it was first put on paper in 1879. So even uh, in World War II, it was an older design, but it was chosen uh, with some input from Roosevelt uh, because it was quick. The Liberty ship has flat sides. So you can take a big piece of steel and lay it up and put another piece of steel next to it, another piece next to that and so forth. The only steel that has to be bent, which is much more labor intensive, is at the bow and the stern. There are very few curves uh, on it. It also lends itself to modular construction. Parts could be built remotely, brought to the yard and put into place. Roosevelt had been in the Navy. He'd ser served on destroyers and, and cruisers, and uh, he called the Liberty ships ugly ducklings. But he was very supportive of the building program because his idea was build them faster than the German U-boats can sink them. In the early days of World War II, uh, the merchant fleet lost a lot of ships on the way across to Europe and then back again. A uh, total of 764 merchant ships were damaged in both uh, the Atlantic and the Pacific during the war. Only 200 of those were liberties. Um, the oil tankers were actually the preferred target for the U-boats um, because they, they made a big fire when they uh, went up with a, a torpedo. Um, but the uh, 
the Navy got together with the Merchant Marine and very quickly came up with the, uh, what they said was the solution to the problem, which was escorted convoys, convoys of merchant ships escorted by destroyers and cruisers, which uh, had uh, depth charges to drop on the uh, submarines. And the second part of that was, of course, build the ships very quickly uh, so we'd have more of them. In addition to the overall design, lines plan of the ship, the design of the main engine on Liberty ships was also very elderly. It was another British design, again, from the 1880s. And it was a steam engine, three cylinder, what's called a triple expansion steam engine. Uh, the Jeremiah O'Brien has two big boilers, which are fi fired by oil. And the high pressure steam comes out of the boiler and goes into a small high pressure piston. After one cycle of that piston, the steam exhausts into the intermediate pressure piston, which after one more cycle exhausts into the low pressure piston. <clears throat> In total, uh, if uh, the boilers are working at full pressure, it can produce 76 RPMs uh, on the propeller shaft. What kind of horsepower? 2,500 horsepower. Uh, which compared to a modern ship is trivial. Uh, they, modern ships have a lot more power, but uh, that's uh, what the Liberties had. Um, this is a drawing of what the engine looks like. The propeller shaft comes out on the lower left. The boilers are center right, uh, and the three pistons, which I'll show a picture of, are sort of top left. So this is what the engine room on the Jeremiah O'Brien looks like. The uh, orange item is a pressure relief valve at the top of the cylinder. And this uh, small cylinder here is the high pressure piston. The second one, somewhat larger, is the intermediate pressure piston. And down here, somewhat hidden by the light, is the large low pressure piston. So the steam progresses from the high pressure piston at the top through the middle to the bottom and then cycles back into the boiler from there. This is what the uh, connecting rod looks like from above, uh, well lubricated. And uh, when the ship's underway, this is going up and down on a regular basis. Yeah. Those of us who think about V8 engines, let's say in a Mercedes or something, the stroke is like about that far, right? The stroke <laughs> is measurable in inches. So this is yeah. six feet. These yeah, are it's, it's definitely going up and down a good, good distance. Amazing. Um, when James Cameron made the movie Titanic, he filmed the engine room scene in our engine room on the Jeremiah O'Brien. Uh, he brought down the big uh, Hollywood cameras. They fitted uh, wide angle lenses so that things would look bigger than they really are. Uh, got very close to the equipment and filmed it uh, for about four days in the engine room. And the uh, engine room crew, the Black Gang, as they're called, uh, had a great time uh, knowing that they were contributing to a major Hollywood movie. He wanted that kind of equipment that's going up and down and turning and, and steam is uh, escaping a little bit around some of the valves, uh, packings and things. Uh, you know, it, it really uh, was a, a working piece of equipment and a, a working engine room. And that's exactly what he wanted for the movie. So that's what he got. In addition to the deck gang and the engine gang, uh, Liberty ships in World War II were armed. Usual armament was a five inch 38, uh, which was usually mounted aft, and two three inch 50s that were mounted up forward. Uh, in addition, uh, eight Bowler Force guns, 20 millimeter anti aircraft guns uh, mounted around the ship. And the Navy didn't trust the Merchant Marine to handle the guns and the ammunition. So they sent a Navy gun crew on every Liberty ship, somewhere between 15 and as many as 28 guys, usually one officer uh, and a group of enlisted men. And they're the ones that handled the defense of the ship. You can climb up in the gun tubs on the Jeremiah O'Brien and see the guns. Um, you can actually crank them around and turn the whole turret and uh, you know pretend you're shooting, shooting at Berkeley or something like that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, the kids love it. They, they absolutely just think it's wonderful. Do you have to keep the Stanford and the Cal kids off these ships? <laughs> uh, yeah, we, we, we have to make sure they don't have any live rounds. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> so I talked about the modular construction. Um, this is uh, a section of, uh, this is the bow that was being sent over to Richmond Yard number four, uh, and it is the bow uh, of a Liberty ship. Uh, the inscription is upside down, but it says to yard for Richmond, 
from Pacific Coast Engine Company Alameda. So the bow of the ship was made in Alameda, loaded on a railway car, shipped up to Richmond, lifted by a crane, put in place, uh, and welded up by Wendy the welder. This mm -hmm. later in the in the war was a, a standard uh, construction technique that they used for a lot of different sections of the ship. So they the, prefab pieces in specialty uh, yards. Right, exactly. Um, many of the engines were built in Ohio. Uh, some were built in uh, Illinois and some in Indiana. Uh, and other parts uh, were built all over the United States and, and uh, shipped to wherever they were needed uh, and installed on the ships. These are the four stages, uh, roughly, of building a Liberty ship. Um, starting in the upper left, number one, uh, the uh, ribs of the ship, the longitudinals are in place, uh, but they're just starting the work. Uh, in number two, uh, they have a lot of the athwart ship's beams in place. They're starting to uh, frame up patches and what have you. Uh, in number three, the uh, engines and heavy equipment will have already been loaded into the ship because they're putting the deck in. So that's fairly far along. And then in number four, the bunting is hung uh, and the celebration's about to begin when they launch the ship. Amazing. And this was 56 days, typically. 56 days, typically, uh, as little as 40 toward the end of the war. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. It never stopped. Big Klieg lights all around the yard to provide light so they could work uh, all night. So on a nice sunny day uh, in South Portland, Maine, June the 19th, 1943, the Jeremiah O'Brien was launched, and there she goes sliding down the ways. She was then quickly fitted out and sent off to convoy duty. Now, while this may look like the container ships off Los Angeles at the moment uh, with our supply chain <laughs> problems, uh, it is uh, actually uh, a convoy being put together in Halifax, Nova Scotia to go across to England. And uh, convoys were an effective way to counter the U-boats, but uh, they did certainly lose ships uh, out of the convoy uh, as well. Uh, Why was the convoy safer? Uh, the convoy was safer because the ships were arranged in rows and ranks, and then the uh, ships on the outside were the destroyers and the cruisers. And they were, uh, from the middle of the war onwards, were fitted with sonar, which uh, enabled them to uh, locate the submarines and go out and attack them before they could do any damage. The convoy route to Europe was basically in three segments. The area close to Canada and the United States could be defended by anti-submarine aircraft from shore bases. The uh, last part getting close to England and Europe could be defended by anti-aircraft, uh, anti-submarine aircraft from England and Ireland. But the part in the middle was what was dangerous because it was out of the range of aircraft and that's where the wolf packs tended to hang out uh, so they could attack more easily. Now what is today Reykjavik Airport in Iceland was built uh, on a very hurry up basis as an airfield uh, during World War II so that we could base anti-submarine aircraft in Iceland. Iceland belonged to Denmark. Denmark had been conquered by the Nazis, but Iceland was very happy to participate in the war effort on the Allied side. So the, uh, that's the reason the airport is uh, to heck and gone from downtown Reykjavik. Uh, it's about 30 miles or so, but it was the uh, air base and then later a NATO air base uh, for anti-submarine planes. When you fly into Reykjavik, you see that, you see what a great distance it is away. And now you're telling us why again. Right, exactly. Yeah, it's a long ways. And there's a, a, a large uh, airstrip at, on the southern end of Greenland at a place called Kangerlussak, uh, which was also built for the same reason, for uh, anti-submarine uh, planes during World War II. And then um, anti-submarine efforts by NATO planes during the Cold War as well, keeping track of Russian submarines. So the Jeremiah O'Brien departed for Europe uh, on her first trip in July of 1943. Uh, and as I said, made five convoy trips uh, to England. Um, during one of the convoys, uh, it was attacked, uh, but not hit, the torpedo missed. And uh, became the beginning of the uh, nickname, the Lucky O'Brien, because it was saved from uh, the U-boat attack. Why did the U-boat miss it? The torpedoes in World War II were not nearly as accurate as uh, anyone would have liked. Uh, ours were not, uh, and the Germans were not either. Um, you were trying to uh, fire a torpedo from a moving vessel, the submarine, to hit another moving vessel, your target, 
um, and uh, it was it was pretty difficult. Sometimes in movies they make it look like it was really easy, but uh, it was not. So anyway, the uh, O'Brien arrived uh, at D-Day plus three uh, at uh, the beach in Normandy uh, three days after the original invasion and uh, discharged its cargo and then uh, made 11 shuttle trips back and forth uh, ferrying cargo and troops. You may have heard a story that three ships broke, broke, broke in two and sank. Well, yes, actually three did and three were lost. Uh, several others suffered structural failures, but were not lost. They were able to be saved. And indeed, the Jeremiah O'Brien herself had some problems uh, in that regard as well. Um, why is that? Well, first of all, because the North Atlantic is an extremely unforgiving environment. Uh, they encountered bad weather, uh, and uh, they were, of course, built in a hurry. I'm not saying that corners were cut, but uh, they were trying to do things quickly. Uh, and sometimes that led to problems. But overall, only three were lost out of 2,710. And most of the damage occurred right in the square of the hatches. Uh, there were five hatches. And where the two pieces of steel meet at a right angle is what the engineers call a stress riser. And the cracks would propagate out from the corner of the hatch. Uh, and considerable damage was done, including uh, even on the Jeremiah O'Brien. But the solution, which proved to be very effective, was to take a very heavy piece of steel, bend it into a curve, and weld it into all four corners of all five hatches to strengthen it so that it could take the forces as the ship was rolling and going through uh, the waves. Wouldn't that be like a, a knee? Yeah. Exactly, yeah. And you can still see them today. They're uh, very visible on the Jeremiah O'Brien. Well, after World War II, the government found itself the proud owner of all of these Liberty ships with nothing to do with them. Uh, the war was over, they didn't really need them. Uh, and they sold them usually at fire sale prices uh, to steamship companies, usually US flag steamship operators like Waterman and Likes and US lines, but also foreign flag steamship companies as well. And they became the main cargo carrying ships in the 1940s, 1950s, and even a little bit into the 1960s. But their demise resulted from the fact that they were too slow and too small. They just couldn't carry that much cargo and they went very slowly. And then a brilliant gentleman named Malcolm McLean, who was in the trucking business, invented containerization. He put the first containers on the first ship and uh, the rest, as they say, is history. So the uh, Liberty ships passed out of cargo servant, but the Jeremiah O'Brien was way ahead of that. The Jeremiah O'Brien actually only served for two and a half years initially. In February of 1946, it was retired and sent up to the Navy's inactive ship facility in Susun Bay in Northern California, not far from Richmond where it was put into mothballs and stored for 33 years. And to be honest, nobody ever expected it would be used again because it was too small and too slow. But then the hero of the activity uh, comes onto the scene. His name was Admiral Tom Patterson. And he worked for the Maritime Administration, part of Department of Commerce in Washington. And Tom Patterson was determined that there would be a Liberty ship preserved as a memorial to the men who had served on them and the men and women who had built them. And one of his jobs was to approve the ships to be scrapped when they were taking them out of the inactive ship facilities in places like James River, Virginia, uh, Portland, Oregon, uh, Seattle and San Francisco. And every time a list of ships for scrapping was presented to Admiral Patterson who had to sign off on it, he would scratch off the name of the Jeremiah O'Brien. <laughs> so it never got scrapped. And we consider that the second time the Jeremiah O'Brien was <laughs> saved. And uh, again, the lucky O'Brien, uh, lucky O'Brien's good luck held. In uh, 1978, he founded the National Liberty Ship Memorial and he persuaded the government to sell the Jeremiah O'Brien to the NLSM for the princely sum of $1. Uh, and uh, we were obligated to uh, take it out of the reserve fleet in Susun Bay. And then the Jeremiah O'Brien did something that no ship has ever done before or since. 
it sailed out of a mothball fleet under its own steam. No ship had ever done that before. They always had to be towed by tugboats. But the volunteer crew went up and worked in Susun Bay for a month, got all the uh, equipment in the engine room running. And although it looked pretty bad, it was pretty rusty and dirty and so forth, uh, it could steam out under its own power, uh, which they were very proud of. Following that, they put nearly half a million volunteer hours into cleaning it up, painting it, chipping the rust, uh, getting it to look good, getting all the equipment to operate, getting the cargo gear uh, operable uh, and so forth. And in May of 1980, the ship made its first cruise as, an, as a National Liberty Ship Memorial vessel. Uh, and from then on, generally made three sailing weekends per year, Memorial Day, 4th of July, and during Fleet Week in October uh, to see the Blue Angels. As the 50th anniversary of Normandy approached in uh, 1993, the uh, anniversary being 1994, uh, the idea was floated that perhaps ships that had been there 50 years earlier should go back as part of the celebration. And the three ships that were contacted were the Liberty ship in Baltimore, the John W. Brown, the uh, Jeremiah O'Brien, and the Lane Victory uh, down in San Pedro, Long Beach, California. The uh, crews were enthusiastic about the idea, but they could not make the uh, John W. Brown or the Lane Victory operable. They could not persuade the Coast Guard and the uh, American Bureau of Shipping that they were seaworthy. But the uh, crew of the Jeremiah O'Brien did. They uh, got their inspection from ABS. They got the Coast Guard to sign off. And on April 18th, 1994, they departed from San Francisco. The crew was what we call an older demographic, to say the least. Uh, the average age was 75. And uh, a gentleman many of you know, Carl Nolte, who writes for the San Francisco Chronicle, signed on as an ordinary seaman. And he yeah. wrote dispatches <laughs> from the ship and published that Chronicle published them, uh, the mm -hmm. story as it was making its way through the Panama Canal up the East Coast and across to England. We all love Carl Nolte. He was a Wednesday Yachting Luncheon guest within the last couple of months. Carl's a great guy. He he's, <laughs> serves on our board uh, and uh, is very active. Terrific, terrific citizen and uh, a treasure of the Bay Area. He is, he is indeed. Um, so the ship arrived a little early, May in 1994, um, and on the actual anniversary, June 6th, 50 years after the Normandy invasion, the Jeremiah O'Brien anchored off Pont du Hoc, uh, one of the uh, jumping off points for the Marines uh, in the invasion, uh, and it got a tremendous amount of attention. The uh, French people came on board. They were just lavish in their praise of the ship and their thanks to the Americans for saving them from the Germans. It was uh, apparently very touching for the guys that were there. Uh, and uh, President uh, Clinton came on board uh, with Hillary. Uh, the president of France came on board. A number of dignitaries visited uh, while it was uh, in France. And then in June, it went across uh, to England and it went up the Thames River into London. And it was the only Liberty ship ever to go under Tower Bridge in London. So there's, wow. there's the Jeremiah O'Brien again fabulous support and enthusiasm from the British. They lined up for hours to come on board and visit, uh, and uh, it was extremely popular, and the guys had a great time who were on the crew. They finally turned around and went home, and the ship got back uh, in September of 94, and then uh, it uh, began its regular uh, Memorial Day, 4th of July, and Fleet Week cruises, and life was good for the Jeremiah O'Brien until May 23rd, 2020, when Pier 45 Shed A burned in a spectacular fire. It began about 4.30 in the morning, and at the height of the fire, the flames were more than 100 feet above the bridge of the ship. The fire could be seen for 15 or 20 miles away. The smoke could probably be seen for close to 100 miles away. And through absolutely heroic efforts of the fireboat San Francisco, the ship was saved from much more serious damage. The fireboat came right in, put her bow against the pier, sprayed water down the side of the ship, sprayed water along the side of the shed, 
and really preserved the ship from a lot more damage because we were probably within half an hour of putting out an emergency call for tugs, cutting our lines and pulling the ship away just be, to uh, save it from the fire. As it was, we lost all the cargo gear on the starboard side. Um, I say we lost it. Um, when you expose wire to high temperature, it loses its tensile and you've got to replace it. It's no longer safe to use. We lost all the mooring lines, of course. Um, we have some uh, interesting uh, large trash containers that are plastic, which are now concave because of the heat of the fire. Uh, had to throw those away and so forth. But all things considered, um, we were very lucky. We did not lose uh, a lot more than we could have. Cost of damages? Uh, about $270,000 in damage. Um, for, fortunately, the majority of which was paid by our insurance company. Um, I give Navigators Hartford uh, insurance credit. They, they stepped right up and didn't quibble with us about uh, the loss. We had to replace uh, four portholes, um, uh, the coverings on the lifeboats on the starboard side, um, just a whole a variety of, oh, the, uh, the radar repeater, um, a variety of different things, some of which were quite expensive but uh, they, they stepped up and we got them replaced. And this was what we call the third time that the ship was sailed, saved, the uh, lucky O'Brien saved for the third time. So I would encourage all of you to come and visit us. Uh, we're back at Pier 45. Um, the shed on the left-hand side of that picture is no longer there because that's partly what burned, uh, but the ship is there. We're open from 10 in the morning until 4.30 in the afternoon. Uh, and we love having visitors. And I would be remiss if I didn't point out that we have cruises on uh, October 8th and 9th coming up from, for Blue Angels Week. We have uh, now probably two Memorial Day cruises, the 20th and 21st, uh, and we may or may not be able to uh, have a 4th of July cruise as well. Uh, so I encourage you to come on board and particularly come out on a cruise. Um, there's plenty of room. We can carry 956 passengers, according to the Coast Guard, uh, which is a, a lot more than even the troops that they carried. And I can tell you from several trips that it is the best view of the Blue Angels from anywhere, because we hang out with the ship between Alcatraz and Berkeley, and that's right at the end of the flyway where the FA-18s come over and sometimes go vertical right above the ship. Uh, it's really something awesome to see. That is one of several thousand pictures I've taken from the deck of the ship during uh, <laughs> Blue Angels cruises. My wife gets really tired of me taking pictures, but uh, it's a lot of fun. Talk a little bit about the cruises. Give us the travel log. Give us the pitch. We, we uh, open up at nine and we leave the pier about 10. We usually go out uh, under the Golden Gate Bridge just to give everybody a view from underneath the bridge. That's usually a lot of fun. Um, in the days when the Navy uh, supported Fleet Week a little better, they'd actually have a parade of ships. And we would go out and meet up with as many as 12 ships from the US Navy, the Coast Guard, the Canadian Navy, and sometimes the Mexican Navy. Uh, we'd all get in a line astern and come in uh, under the Golden Gate Bridge. And then the other ships would go out under uh, the Bay Bridge and usually tie up down at 3032, Pier 28, and so forth down south of the Bay Bridge. We would then, uh, we would go under the Bay Bridge as well, give everybody that experience. And then we would come back out uh, and basically hang out, as I said, between Alcatraz and Berkeley. Um, we would have a band on board. Um, we uh, had beer and wine available uh, and served lunch on board. Everybody would uh, enjoy the sunshine and the views. And uh, it's remarkable how good the weather is in early October in San Francisco. Um, we've never had a bad day, touch wood. Um, don't think we ever will. Um, and then the air show starts about three o'clock, uh, maybe 2.30 uh, with some other smaller planes, uh, stunt planes and so forth. The Blue Angels normally show up about 3.15 to 3.30, uh, put on their show, uh, which is absolutely incredible. Um, and uh, about the noisiest thing you'll ever hear. And uh, then uh, head back um, down to the peninsula uh, where they land at Moffett Field. Uh, and then we come back and tie up at the pier normally about 4.30. So it's about a 10 to 4.30 uh, full day out on the bay. 
Um, I uh, have great respect having driven ships myself uh, for Captain Savannah Lasseur, who's our captain, who uh, has to navigate the ship through all of the sailboats, power boats, jet skis, uh, ferry boats, dinner cruise boats, you name it. Everything in the world is out there on the bay uh, during that time. And uh, he manages to get us through it all and, and back safely to the pier. But uh, it's definitely a lot of fun. So talk about the restoration costs and then the, what's the annual budget to keep or maintain? Uh, the budget uh, annual cost is normally about a million dollars. Uh, it costs to keep the ship up. Um, it, that covers the fuel, the food, the spare parts, um, all of the different things that have to be done. Um, but the last couple of years have really been unusual. Um, we uh, took advantage, if that's the right word, of uh, the COVID shutdown when the ship was uh, not able to take any visitors on board to do a project uh, which was enormous in scale. Um, we replaced all 2,200 boiler tubes, uh, 1,100 in each boiler. The tubes were never meant to be replaced. Uh, the ship was built for one trip across the Atlantic. If it made one trip, it had paid for itself. If it made two or three, that was all the better. Um, and we st steamed for, uh, eight, for 77 years on the original boiler tubes. But some of them were leaking. Um, we did a, a series of small patches and what have you. And we finally decided to replace them all. And so John Eaton, the chief engineer, and Dave Winter, the uh, port engineer, and their crew did a fabulous job of replacing all of the tubes with brand new ones. And so the ship is good for at least another 77 years now. Uh, but that was, of course, a major item of expense, um, just buying the tubes. And then we had to hire a couple of uh, experts from uh, Ohio to come out and help us uh, determine how best to do that job. Um, we have to replace a lot of things from time to time. Um, all the life jackets have to be replaced every once in a while. The life rafts uh, have to be either recertified, uh, which we usually do once and then dispose of them the second time and, and buy new ones. Um, all sorts of uh, other expenses, of course. Um, a lot of 77, 78 year old equipment just breaks down and stops working. Um, I had an experience uh, when I was sailing on uh, the Navy Liberty ship, where uh, at two o'clock in the morning, I sat bolt upright and I knew something was seriously wrong. And I was listening and I couldn't hear anything. And I realized that what was wrong was I couldn't hear anything because the freshwater feed pump that feeds uh, very purified water into the boiler was a reciprocating pump that went thump, 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 thump. thump. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. And it was one of those white noise things that you just ignored. You just didn't even think about, except at two o'clock in the morning one night, it stopped working. And, and everyone on the ship woke up like, what's the matter? What's wrong? <laughs> Until we finally figured out what it was. So there's just a lot of things like that, valves that need to be replaced and what have you. And uh, the uh, uh, tanks, the freshwater tanks, the fuel tanks and the ballast tanks, were never coated on the inside because their ship was built in a hurry. No, no thought of doing that. Now that all has to be done. A American Bureau of Shipping requires it. Uh, so that's another thing we're gonna have to do during the shipyard period this year in November up in uh, Vallejo. Uh, the budget for the shipyard period is uh, bare minimum about 1.5 million. Uh, you throw in some nice to have items and it's probably like 1.7 million. So, um, I can certainly encourage anyone who's willing to make a donation to the ship. We would be more than appreciative of having that. Um, also encourage anybody uh, who's interested to come on board, come and see us, visit the ship. Um, it's, uh, it's very interesting. And there are a lot of dedicated docents who like telling stories, as you might've gathered, I'm one of those. Um, tell the story of the ship and, uh, and everything about it uh, and point out things that are certainly not visible from below. Uh, or on the dock below. You have to get up on the ship, you have to climb down into the engine room uh, and so forth, but it's uh, it's well worth it and uh, it's a lot of fun. How many volunteer hours per year do you invest in it? Oh, good question. We have um, 150 volunteers in total of whom about 100, I would say, are really active. Uh, and there are certain docents, for example, that come every Thursday. They just 
that's on part of their life, part of their schedule. They come every, you know, could be Tuesday, could be Sunday, whatever. Um, the uh, entire deck gang comes in uh, and works on Wednesday. The entire engineering department comes in and works on Thursday. So they can schedule big jobs uh, for those days when the whole group is there. And then others come in at different times. When you sail her now and you go on a cruise, how, what's the cruise size? And what's the hospitality component of that? We, we sail with a crew of 56. That's the deck department, the engine department, the stewards department, which provides food, the radio men, and we actually have a gunnery crew, although they don't actually fire the guns, but they just do the maintenance. Uh, but those are the five departments within the ship um, and uh, 56 uh, people. That's what they sail to Normandy with. And that's enough to, you know, to get everything done because of course you need to have uh, enough people to stand watches. Um, usually four hour watches, um, you know, usually four hours on, eight hours off, uh, another four hours on and so forth. Um, and uh, then the uh, stewards department has to prepare four meals a day, the regular breakfast, lunch and dinner, and then what's called mid rats uh, for the group that's going on watch at midnight. They get, uh, you know, a heavy snack, as it were, uh, at 1130 at night. So uh, yeah, it's it's a big operation, and it has to uh, even when we're tied up alongside the pier in San Francisco, uh, it's still 24 hours a day. We have two shipkeepers on board 24 hours a day. Uh, you just for things like that big fire that we had in May of 2020, you have to have someone there in case something bad really happens, uh, and to check the bilges once in a while to make sure that you're not taken on water and that sort of thing. We do have the advantage um, of being able to secure the ship rather easily. Uh, the only way on and off is the gangway. And uh, at uh, sometime around six or seven at night, we simply pull the gangway up. And so there's, there's no way that uh, intruders could come on board, anyone who's unwanted, and the uh, shipkeepers can feel safe when they're uh, on it in the middle of the night. What is the security component of a, an ancient ship like this? Are there nutty people who don't want to, don't respect and appreciate it? Do you have to pay attention to things like that? Uh, very sadly, yes, that is true. Um, we have had people come on board the ship and take a big fire axe off the bulkhead, which we're required by the Coast Guard to have in various locations around the ship, and go carrying it off. And we have no idea what they might have intended to do with it. But uh, fortunately, our uh, executive director, who is a retired master sergeant in the US Marine Corps, uh, doesn't put up with any BS. And uh, he immediately relieved them uh, in two instances uh, of those fire axes. Uh, we have not had a serious uh, event of sabotage, if you want to call it that, but um, we have had some fairly sketchy people at times come on board, and that's why when we're open, we have to have a certain number of docents around keeping an eye on things. And uh, honestly, the fire that uh, happened at Pier and Shed A, Pier 45, um, was very likely caused by homeless people building campfires. Uh, and uh, they've, they've certainly been around. They've tried to come on the ship a time, from time to time. Uh, which is one of the reasons we close it up at <laughs> six or seven at night. So now the ship is an antique, uh, 78 years old, but you might have some modern communications tools in it. When you go sailing now, I'm assuming you have modern nav systems. And what about the kitchen equipment? You have radar ranges and things like that that are modern. And how do you draw the line between what's authentic 78 year old and what's um, more modern and practical? Very, very good question. Um, we have a very modern radar system. Um, they put a radar on for the trip in 1994 to Normandy. Um, we've even upgraded that since then. So we even have a more modern radar system for now. Um, of course, we have GPS as well and a modern radio system for communication. So all of that part of it uh, has to be covered. Um, but most of the rest of the ship uh, is original. Um, there's a serious discussion going on right now about the oven and stove in the galley, because in the year 2021, they are still fired by coal. Oh my goodness. <laughs> they, do, oh. they burn coal. Don't, don't <laughs> tell Joe sense. Manchin. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> don't, don't, we, don't, 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 We've been talking about that. We've been saying, isn't it about time we upgraded that a little bit? <laughs> so we might. What is cruising efficiency? How many gallons per hour going what normal cruising speed? 
Uh, a ship like the Jeremiah O'Brien generally measures in tons per day. Uh, we don't normally measure gallons because they're too small. and <laughs> We burn a lot of them. Um, I believe that the ship burns around four tons a day. I'm not positive about that number, but that's what I think. Um, it has been um, modified very slightly now to burn uh, a form of diesel fuel uh, in World War II. And even the ship I was on in the Navy built, burned something called Navy Special Fuel Oil, NSFO, which was a little heavier than diesel fuel. But nowadays it's just regular diesel fuel. Uh -huh. And how much can it store? How many gallons? And what's the cruising range? Uh, pretty significant cruising range. I, I would, I'm not sure of the total uh, tonnage or gallonage, but um, it can certainly make 5,000, 6,000 miles if it's fully loaded, fully fueled up. So gets down to Panama, gets refueled in Panama, goes to the East Coast someplace if it wanted to go back to England, and then would get fuel to go across. Yeah, I think they, um, I don't think they refueled even in Panama. I think they refueled when they went into New York um, and then went across and then fueled uh, in Virginia, I think Norfolk uh, on the way back. Um, and then we're able to um, make it all the way through the Panama Canal and back up the West Coast. So you, in other words, you think it's got a cruising range could go from here to Virginia, here to the East Coast, through the canal, through the East yeah, Coast. Yeah, I think, I think it could if it was fully loaded, yeah. Yeah, so that would be like about seven, how many thousand miles would that be? Uh, that's probably around between five and 6,000 miles. Yeah. Five and 6,000 mile cruising range. Holy macaroni. What's the email address for people to send some kind of a donation to the Jeremiah O'Brien? Yeah, the uh, website is www.jeremiahobrien, like all one word, dot org. Um, you can certainly Google Jeremiah O'Brien. That will be the first thing that comes up. Um, and uh, it will tell you uh, how to donate. There's a donate button uh, on the website. Um, and uh, the uh, email address is forest, F-O-R-R-E-S-T, at ssjeremiahobrien.org. So now it costs a million bucks a year for you guys to keep this beautiful treasure uh, uh, floating and looking good. Where, what are the source of funds each year? Well, we... Um, I'm glad you asked that, um, because we get no government funding whatsoever. We get nothing from the federal government, state government, city, county, uh, any government agency. It is only funded by donations and the cost of uh, ticket sales for people coming on board alongside the pier and going out on the cruises. Um, so um, we try to do fundraising. We're uh, approaching some foundations and uh, organizations that have an interest in the maritime industry. Uh, but yes, we're very much uh, dependent on donations. And particularly this year, uh, having the uh, dry docking bill coming up, uh, we're going to be working very hard on that. Well, uh, Forrest, lots of people spend their time putzing around in golf courses. And lots of other people spend plenty of time in domino tournaments. You've been putting your thoughtful professional energy to an incredible monument, the Jeremiah O'Brien. As one who has spent some time on the Jeremiah O'Brien, I have a reverence for the folks who built them. They were part of the greatest generation. And I've got to say also the folks who are preserving them. Thank you so much for the good service you're providing. And thank you so much for being a guest on the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon. Thank you, Ron. I really enjoyed doing it. It was a lot of fun. This has been a presentation of the Wednesday Yachting Luncheon.